Welcome to part three of my seven part series of Robert's Guide to Buying an Electric Bike. Manufacturers haven't yet come to a consensus as to where to place the battery on their electric bikes. Some place it conspicuously on top of the rear rack. This option makes the battery easy to remove, unless it's a pedicle, and leaves the down tube and the seat tube free for bottle holders or storage bags. Some place the battery at the back of the seat. This is pretty uncommon, and this position can only accommodate a very small battery. Others decide to place it either in front or at the back of the seat post, as in these photos. This places the weight lower and closer to the center of the bike. Some attach it to the down tube, like we see here. And some cleverly hide it inside a custom-made frame. Like the seat post position, these last ones put the weight of the battery in the middle of the bike, providing the rider with better balance and maneuverability. There is one thing to watch out for if you need to charge your bike at the office or if you live on a third floor apartment without an elevator. Is the battery removable? Most batteries are, but some e-bikes can only be recharged by parking the bike close to an electrical outlet. Will there ever be a consensus as to where to place an electric bike battery? When the first e-bikes were built, people took a regular steel frame bicycle and added components to make it into an electric bike. There are still e-bikes being built this way because steel has many strong points that some cyclists find preferable. I'll talk about bicycle frames in section 7 of this series. So the black battery was a separate item that had to be placed somewhere on the bike, either on the rear rack or on one of the down tubes. After switching to aluminum as a building material for the frames, easy molding techniques permitted shaping the frame to allow a space inside the down tube to conceal the battery. Since I began riding e-bikes in 2015, I found that every year an increasing number of manufacturers are adopting this elegant solution. I see this as a natural evolutionary step in the development of the electric bike and it's the way of the future. We know that cars get their energy from a liquid fuel in a tank. The bigger the tank, the further the car can go. But energy for an e-bike is in the form of electrical power stored in a battery. But likewise, the bigger the battery, the farther the bike can go. Instead of being measured in liters or gallons, the energy of an e-bike is measured in watt-hours. A single watt-hour is the small amount of electricity used by a device that uses one watt of power and that's made to run for a period of one hour. For example, a 100-watt light bulb left on for one hour would use 100 watt-hours. There are big differences in the size of battery depending on the e-bike model. They can range anywhere from 180 watt-hours to more than 1,000 watt-hours. The average, I would say, is about 600 watt-hours. Instead of specifying the capacity of the battery in watt-hours, some manufacturers will provide only the voltage and amperage, and you have to figure out the capacity by yourself. Fortunately, it's not complicated. Let's take the example of a 48 volt 10.5 amp battery. You just need to multiply those two numbers to get the watt hours. In this case, 48 times 10.5 gives you 504 watt hours. You might be wondering how long it takes to charge an e-bike battery. The majority of e-bikes come with either a 2 amp or a 3 amp charger that will charge the battery within 4 to 8 hours, depending on the size of the battery. I don't know why, but there's no such thing as fast charging e-bikes. That's something you have to keep in mind if you're riding long distances in a day. As a general rule, manufacturers offer only one size of battery per model of bike, and there's no way of asking for a larger one. Consequently, you might have to buy a second one to carry with you on a long ride. 
An option that's available on many e-bike models is a dual battery arrangement like the Juiced bike. Lithium batteries can be recharged from 500 to 2000 times during their lifetime. To prevent premature aging of the battery, it's best to avoid draining it completely before putting it back on the charger. The simplest way to maintain your lithium battery is to put it on the charger at the end of each ride. If your ride was only 5 or 10 kilometers long and you know that you won't be going on a long ride next time, it's not worth taking the trouble to top it up and it won't do your battery any good nor harm, as long as you don't ever store your battery empty. If you want to learn more about how to maintain your battery, you can watch a video by Area 13 eBikes linked in the description. Lithium batteries don't expire all of a sudden. They lose 5 to 10% of their capacity per year, even if they're not being used. If your battery was bigger than you needed the first year, by the third or fourth year it might be just the correct size. By the time they're 5 to 10 years old, batteries might have lost so much capacity as to render them useless. The moral of the story is that it's wise to buy a battery a bit larger than what you estimate you need. I haven't heard of anybody complaining about having a battery that's too large. Maybe you're wondering how heavy is an e-bike battery? Although lithium batteries are much lighter than the old lead-acid batteries, their weight isn't negligible when you have to carry it around. You can count on the fact that the weight is directly proportional to its power. For example, the 672 watt-hour RAD battery at the left weighs 7.7 .7 pounds and the 950 watt-hour re-engine battery at the right weighs 11.4 pounds. Just to put that in perspective with regards to how far a lithium battery can take you, it takes on average 10 watt-hours to cover 1 kilometer or 16 watt-hours per mile. So, a 500 watt hour battery can take the average e bike 50 kilometers or 30 miles, riding at 26 to 29 kilometers an hour, with the rider providing 50% of the effort. It can be more or less depending on how much exercise you want to do, how fast you want to go, and other conditions. Don't pay any attention to the claims that manufacturers make about the upper limit of the range of their e-bikes. On account of the multitude of factors that affect range, these figures are meaningless. Actually, if you're keen to know what are the 17 factors that affect range, you can watch my video, What is the Range of an Electric Bike, linked at the end of this video. And if you want to dig into it and find an easy to understand explanation of a watt, watch my video, How Much Energy Does an Electric Bike Really Use, linked at the end of this video. What about the cost? You might have heard that an electric bike's most expensive component is its battery. That is correct, except for the very high-end e-bikes. The best way to calculate the true purchase cost of a battery is to calculate the cost per watt hour. For example, in 2023, the Bosch Power Pack 500 battery cost $1,080 in Canadian currency. This comes to $2.15 per watt hour. But other batteries can be much more economical. The 20 amp hour battery for the Havoc X2 Step, which is 960 watt hours, cost only 68 cents per watt hour. There might be a difference in the quality of those two batteries, but I have no way of knowing. You can find cheap Chinese-made batteries on eBay for even less, although I wouldn't count on them to be durable or safe. This brings me to the following point, the security of your valuable battery. Battery locks and switches. The lock operated by a key secures the battery to the bike's frame to deter theft. The switch turns the power off when the battery isn't being used. Batteries that have a simple lock and on-off switch, which are found on entry-level e-bikes, are subject to tampering, which means that anybody could hop onto your bike and ride away with the aid of the motor. Manufacturers have come up with two different strategies to overcome this. 
The low-tech method is to equip the battery with a three-position lock, off, lock, and power. When you turn the key from the off position, the first click locks the battery onto the frame. At that point, there's no power to the system, so nobody can take your bike and use the motor for a quick getaway. To turn the power on, it takes a second click. On most e-bikes, once the battery is powered, you need to turn the system on with a button on the selector switch or on the display. The high-end solution to prevent unauthorized use of the bike is to require a password to be entered into the display to power the bike. With some high-end bikes, you can power them on through an app on your phone. But I'll tell you, old-fashioned me prefers the physical key. Of course, in addition to a tamper-proof powering system, you want to lock your bike to a bicycle rack or some kind of strong structure. A feature found on all batteries except some cheap imports is a charge level indicator. It consists of a button and three or four LEDs that light up. I find this useful when I've had my batteries in the house for a while and I want to verify that they're all fully recharged. Finally, you might have heard horror stories about e-bike batteries catching on fire and burning down buildings in New York City and elsewhere. For more information, watch my video, Your Electric Bike May Soon Be Illegal, linked in the description. The long and the short of it is that if you buy an e-bike from a reputable bicycle shop, you should be getting a good quality battery. The gold standard for bicycle battery safety is to make sure it has underwriter's laboratory certification, which all e-bike manufacturers are going to be required to obtain. There are actions you can take to reduce the chances of a fire. If you're interested, you might like to watch my follow-up video, Tips for Preventing E-Bike Battery Fires, also linked in the description. That's all for part 3 of Robert's Guide for Electric Bikes. Join me for part 4, which will cover the gearing system of electric bikes. We'll see how geared motors and direct drive motors differ with regards to the use of gears, and why this could matter a great deal for you. We will also look at some of the brilliant alternatives to the dreaded derailleur, and we'll talk about the different drive systems for electric bicycles. See you soon. Thank you for watching, and remember, never quit cycling.